Hello, I'm Nathan from Serious Geeks, and this video is going to be a tactical analysis of the Warhammer 40,000 9th edition and what really wins games. Is it kill hammer or is it play into the objectives? Spoiler, it's play into the objectives. That may seem like an obvious answer. However, for many editions, longer than I care to remember, winning games in Warhammer 40,000 was all about just wiping the opponent off the board and then clearing up the objectives afterwards. Each edition, Games Workshop seems to want to move into a direction that focuses more on actually playing the game as intended, rather than just lining up and shooting the opponents. And they seem to have not failed, but not really excelled in any of those attempts in the past. Let's just put it that way. Be it previous editions where only troops could hold objectives to force people to take troops choices, or actual limitations on what you could take because you were taking detachments, and therefore had to take troops choices to fill those detachments, there was always a flaw. As an example, the sheer amount of killing power in an army list could wipe troops out, and it would make you really weak, and once you were wiped off the board, you couldn't win the game. As a separate example, taking troops to fill up command points meant that we were command point farming and hungry for those amount of command points, therefore the whole game was skewed to actually build in a list that could operate with a set amount of command points. In this latest edition, the ninth edition, Warhammer 40,000 has gone a long way to balance what's come before it. And I'm actually quite happy after a few of my example games where I've actually been able to experience what you have to do on the tabletop. There's a lot of victory points up for grabs if you look at the primary objectives of any of the strike force missions, which is what I'm going to primarily talk about simply because most people will be playing those size games. However, what I'm talking about today will be relevant for other sized games such as Incursion and Onslaught, which all use very similar sorts of objectives in their missions. If you take a look at the Eternal War missions, you will see that not a single mission has less than four objectives. In fact, half of them actually have six. If you look at how you score in each of these missions, they all hold a lot of very similar rules. You have to hold one or more objectives to score five points. You score an additional five points if you score two or more objectives, which I think most people will be able to do in a game. And if you control more objective markers than your opponent, you will control enough objectives to score you an additional five points, giving you a full 15. That is progressive and you score it at the end of your command phase, which means you will be getting 15 points a turn, essentially, if you manage to land on the objective ready for next turn. What this means is your very first turn of the game is going to be impossible to score any of the primary objectives. However, if you set yourself up correctly, you will start scoring from the second turn onwards. And you capped at scoring 15 points a turn, which is fairly obvious. But what that means is that you'll be getting a lead on your opponent if they're not scoring any. In fact, in my own experience, what I've witnessed and played myself is if one player scores a load of primary objectives ahead of the opponent, you get a large lead that is going to be very difficult, no matter how much damage they do to your army, for them to ascend to, and therefore you're probably going to win the game. So what does this mean if you want to build your army list to actually win games of Warhammer 40,000? It means what you're going to have to do is build an army list that can move quickly to the objectives to take these points ahead of the opponent or at least contest them it means you're going to have to have enough survivability to be able to do this in the face of the opponent's attack or counter-attack as the case may be you're also going to have to have numbers on the board and be able to operate spread across that board because you're going to need to be able to hold these objectives for a long period of time and survivability only goes so far in 40k you're not going to survive a Tau gun line standing right in front of them, no matter how tough you are, as an example. And being able to spread across the board and still operate is incredibly crucial to Warhammer 40,000 right now. There's no more character castles and aura chains if you want to win games of Warhammer 40,000. You have to spread across the board, which means your units are not going to be close enough to benefit from the auras of characters, which means your characters are going to have to spread across the board, which also means they're more likely to be killed which goes back to survivability and troop numbers. As such, when you build a list, I think you're going to have to bear in mind transports. Transports are incredibly useful. They get units around the board quickly to deliver them to objectives, as well as engage the enemy. 
and also, critically, they can hold an objective whilst the rest of your army carries on fighting. So relatively cheap transports, I think, will be very important for Homer 40,000 right now. Having a decent number of models on the board will also enable you to spread and take those objectives without being compromised. It means that your killing potential may be limited because you're going to have to choose units and models that are relatively cheap in comparison to others and at least not be able to take an all assault army or an all elites army that has absolutely no support whatsoever. I'm not saying those armies don't work, I'm saying that they will be very niche and very cleverly used to get the best out of. For the rest of us, I think we'll just stick to nice combined arms approaches to win our games, which I think is going to be very effective going forward. Lastly, each mission does have secondary objectives. I will go over secondary objectives in another video at another time, but in short, you have to be able to use these secondary objectives to top up your primary objective scoring. So if you and your opponent are both holding two or more objectives, and neither one of them has more than the other, you're going to be scoring 10 points a turn, which is it's essentially going to be a deadlock. It's going to be a tie. You're going to draw the game. However, if you have secondary objectives and you choose them correctly, you can top up your primary objectives to really accelerate your lead or to push yourself ahead of the opponent. Like I said, I will make a video about the secondary objectives and how that affects your army building. However, in short, you're going to have to choose things that you're able to do on the tabletop realistically. If you just sit there and choose the kill kill points version of it, as an example, you're not going to do a lot of damage to a knight army, and therefore you're not going to score many victory points. That objective, by the way, is called Thin Their Ranks. Each mission does have room for secondary objectives, and therefore you can actually not choose one of the generic ones in the rulebook, but choose the one on the actual mission itself. Some of these are quite hard to do. It depends on your army, and I know that in games that I've played, it's not always relevant to me. Like as an example, I played one where I had to take the objectives of the opponent and raise them, which is not an easy thing to do when you're facing an orc horde. As such, I'll probably talk about the secondary objectives in more detail alongside the secondary objectives in the actual generic rulebook so that the mission secondary objectives can basically be bore in mind alongside them because it is very relevant to each other. Which ones are you going to replace? Which ones do you like? Which ones do you think will help your army the best? It's all very difficult puzzle to work out. And everyone's army and everyone's opponent will mean different secondary objectives are going to have to be considered. The use of secondary objectives and the fact that you have to move around the table, spread around the table and operate individually almost, as well as have numbers on the board, is why I really recommend a combined arms approach. Having as many models on the board that can do multiple different things, having a large number of troops whilst having some elite forces to actually engage the enemy, so some heavy firepower but also some vehicles and some faster units, I think these things will help a lot. And I think faster units are going to have a very big impact on the game if you want to hold objectives. It's not just about killing the opponent anymore. With obscuring terrain and the objective rules, it's very possible for you to be able to score a lot of points whilst your opponent is just sitting there killing your army. Therefore, you're going to get a lead and you're going to win the game. It might not be a great game because the opponent didn't have the right list for you to play a decent game with. However, it's going to be a very hollow loss for the opponent and a very, well, I say a hollow victory. A victory is a victory, but you're going to win the game. And if you're in a tournament setting, that means the opponent has lost the game. Therefore, they're going to want to have to take an army that can take advantage of the rules to be able to win the game and therefore take a less killy army. So I think this aspect alone is going to be quite good for us building our list and it's going to be very good for competitive 40k. Anyway, that's it for me. Please enjoy the video. Please like and subscribe and I will be back with another video very soon. Peace out.